Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast about foreign policy and world affairs. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. And in this show, we discuss topical global issues, have conversations with foreign affairs thought leaders and newsmakers, and give you the context you need to understand the world today. Go to globaldispatchespodcast.com to learn more. And now on with the show. In early March, Côte d'Ivoire President Alassane Ouattara announced that he would not seek a constitutionally dubious third term in office. Instead, he would pass the baton to a new generation of Ivorian leadership. Then, in July, his preferred successor suddenly died, so Ouattara opted to run for president once again. This decision sparked protests among the supporters of the opposition, which called for civil disobedience against what they alleged to be an unconstitutional move. Violent crackdowns and clashes ensued, with many people killed. The situation in Côte d'Ivoire today is now very tense ahead of elections that are scheduled for October 31st. There is deep concern of violence surrounding the election, not least because the country has had a history of election-related violence. Back in 2010, when Ouattara was elected, the then-sitting president, Laurent Gbagbo, refused to leave office. Some 3,000 people were killed in the ensuing violence, which led to a dramatic intervention by the French military, who arrested Bagbo and transferred him to the International Criminal Court, where he was wanted for crimes against humanity. Bagbo was subsequently not convicted by the ICC, and though he lives in exile, he seeks to stand in the coming elections. A third longtime figure of Ivorian politics, former President Henri Conan Bédier, is also seeking the presidency. Needless to say, this is a very chaotic situation with a high potential for escalatory violence, according to my guest today, Mohamed Diata. He is a researcher with the Institute for Security Studies and is based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. We kick off discussing the decision of Ouattara to seek re-election and the consequences that is having on the ground in Côte d'Ivoire today. We then discuss the history of rivalry between the three men who have so dominated Ivorian politics for the last 30 years. And finally, we have an extended conversation about the prospects of election-related violence. As Mohamed Diata, I think, aptly explains in this conversation, what happens in Cote d'Ivoire matters uh, both to the region and to the world. And uh, I think you'll appreciate uh, learning more about this very volatile situation right now. Today's episode is supported in part through a partnership with the Carnegie Corporation of New York to feature African voices speaking on peace and security issues in Africa. To access other episodes of this series, please visit globaldispatchespodcast.com. And as always, feel free to reach out to me if you have suggestions of people you would like me to interview or topics you would like me to cover. I always love hearing from you. I get a lot of great ideas from you as well. So send me your ideas. Thank you. You can do so using the contact button on globaldispatchespodcast.com. All right. Now, here is my conversation with Mohamed Diata of the Institute for Security Studies. So just to kick things off, you know, in early March, Watara announced that he would not run for a third term in office and hand over power to a younger generation. What happened? Well, basically, the ruling party had chosen a different candidate for this election in October, former Prime Minister Amadou Gonkoulibaly. So what happened is that he subsequently, the Prime Minister passed away on July 8th. So the ruling party found itself without a candidate. I remember there were early rumors that he died of COVID-19, but subsequent reporting seems to indicate it was a stroke or a heart attack or something. Yeah, he had been sick for years. He actually had a heart operation in 2012. So it's due to complications linked to that medical condition he he had had for years. Mm. I don't think it was related to COVID-19. 
And so he died on July 8th. And so the sort of hand-picked successor of Watara had suddenly died. And so what happened? So party internal discussions determined that the best place candidate in that scenario would then have to be current president Watara. So that's the decision that uh, party leaders made. And Watara was sort of at least saying to the outside world that he was reflecting on it, but those in the know pretty much knew that he was going to run. So he eventually just announced that he was going to be the candidate for the ruling party. And this might be of dubious constitutionality to seek a third term in office. Yes, that is essentially the problem today. Ouattara is, in fact, running for a third term as far as him being you know, in power is concerned. But the ruling party is arguing otherwise. So basically what happened is that the constitution was amended in November 2016. And the ruling party is arguing that on the basis of that new constitution or under that new constitution, Ouattara is allowed to run for a new term, given that this new constitution essentially moved the country from what they call the Second Republic under the previous constitution to what they now refer to as the Third Republic under the constitution that was enacted in 2016. And the constitutional court that decided on who was eligible for the October 2020 election actually approved Watara's candidacy, meaning that they agree with that logic. However, the constitutional court is itself contested by the opposition, and so is the electoral commission. So the opposition has actually called for what essentially would amount to a boycott. They've called for civil disobedience. They have asked that Watara withdraws his candidacy, which they consider to be unconstitutional. And they are also calling for the Constitutional Council, Constitutional Court, as well as the Electoral Commission to be dissolved. Mm -hmm. And finally, they are also asking for an overhaul of the electoral management bodies or institutions. So basically, the Constitutional Court argued that despite the fact that Ouattara came to power in 2010, they said that the new constitution that was adopted in 2016 reset the clock on term limits. And so he gets to keep running. Meanwhile, as you said, the opposition opposes this clearly and has called for civil disobedience. Uh, Who are the opposition in this scenario today? It's a number of political parties and political leaders. And that's really where Côte d'Ivoire, in my view at least, it is where Côte d'Ivoire's troubles really lie. So in the political scene for the past three decades, you've had three key individuals. That includes the current president himself, Alassane Ouattara. You have a former president, Henri Conan Bédier, and as well as other former president, Laurent Gbagbo. We can talk about Gbagbo a bit later you know, his issues with the justice system being in the International Criminal Court. But basically, those are the three main individuals that have taken up the political space in Côte d'Ivoire. So Henri Conan Bédier basically took over from the long-standing leader of Côte d'Ivoire, the first president of Côte d'Ivoire, Félix oufouet Boigny. There was a succession battle between, at the time, Ouattara Prime Minister, Henri Conan Bédier, President of the National Assembly. Conan Bédier eventually succeeded former President Félix oufouet Boigny. What ensued was, you know, years of fighting about power, about who was the legitimate successor to oufouet Boigny. In any case, Bédier was overthrown in 1999. Bagbo eventually ascended to power, was in power for 10 years until the 2010 elections. 
that saw the victory of Alassane Ouattara. That victory actually occurred as a result of a political compromise or a political deal between Henri Conan Bédier and Alassane Ouattara. And it's also as a result of that deal between those two individuals that Ouattara was able to be reelected in 2015. So there was a political deal or agreement between Ouattara and Henri Conan Bédier, and that political deal collapsed last year because the coalition that the two men formed, the president Ouattara wanted actually went ahead and transformed it into a political party against the agreement that it was not going to be the case and that for the 2020 presidential elections, Ouattara was supposed to leave power and support the candidacy of either Henri Conan Bédier himself or his political party known as the PDCI. So the Democratic Party of Côte d'Ivoire. I know it might be a little bit confusing. I think it's actually very clear. And you know, a key inflection point in all of this, which you referenced, was the 2010 election, in which, as you said, Bédier gave his support to Ouattara, who won the election. But Laurent Bagbo refused to give up power. And I remember there was this dramatic scene in which French forces, if I recall, backed by the UN peacekeeping operations there, essentially arrested Bagbo and sent him to The Hague to face war crimes charges and crimes against humanity charges for election-related violence that he fomented following the disputed 2010 elections. And that seems to be the most proximate comparison to what we might be headed for in late October as the country goes to the polls again, because there is this violence that has now erupted in the country owing to Ouattara's decision to run for a third term. Yes, that is absolutely correct. That 2010 is the most or the closest inflection point, if you want. But also what we might be seeing going forward, which we really don't want to see. But the post-electoral crisis in Côte d'Ivoire in end of 2010, early 2011 transpired in the way that you've explained. There were 3,000 people killed as a result. And obviously, former President Laurent Gbagbo has been at the Hague for a couple of years now. He was actually acquitted by the ICC, by the International Criminal Court. The trial is supposed to go on appeal, and that's why he is still, I mean, it's partly why he is still in the egg, but he is or was allowed to move freely, and he made it clear that he wanted to go back to Côte d'Ivoire. He asked for a passport from the government, which he still hasn't gotten. He also announced that he was going to run for this election, but his name was barred from the electoral roll, so which effectively means that he can he also cannot be a candidate for this election. And the reason for him being removed from the electoral roll and for not being able to run is that he was sentenced to 20 years in prison by courts in Côte d'Ivoire. So this moment that we are in in Côte d'Ivoire, whereby those who are in power have managed to keep some of the most vocal opponents outside of the political game. On the case of Laurent Gbagbo, I, I might add that he actually petitioned the African Court on Human and People's Rights to ask them that his rights be restored in terms of his, I mean, his political rights to be able to vote, but also to run. And the court actually sided with them and asked the Côte d'Ivoire government to reinstate Bagbo's political and civil rights. And this is the case for another political figure in Côte d'Ivoire, former president of the National Assembly recently, Guillaume Soro, who is in exile in France. He was also excluded from a running. He also petitioned the African court. The Côte d'Ivoire government was also then asked to reinstate him. 
If you will allow me, what I'm trying to paint as a picture is that the troubles of Côte d'Ivoire today essentially revolves around its political leadership or personnel, rather, some of whom have been in this game for decades. Well, yeah, I mean, it's worth pointing out just how advanced in age these players are. I think the DA is 86 years old. Watara is something like 78. And Bagbo is the baby of the group at 75. I mean, these guys are not young. I mean, you have very old leaders who have been in power for a very long time fighting with each other. Yes, absolutely. And that is essentially the problem. So if you couple this long-standing political rivalry between these key figures with the fact that politics in Côte d'Ivoire for a long time has been basically grounded in what would be called, for lack of a better word, maybe ethnic politics or, you know, politics around your origin, your ethnic origin, but also your region, where you come from in the country, in some ways also your religious identity, if you want. So you have political leaders that are highly divided, but that at times have formed alliances in order to serve their own interest. At the same time, because of the way that politics is done in Côte d'Ivoire, identity politics, maybe you'd call it, you do have an Ivorian society that is divided. And those divisions are obviously used by political leaders in order to sway people one way or another, Mm -hmm. you know, to fight their political battles. So at the end of the day, the people, the citizens are the biggest losers, whereas, you know, the political game is being played by a political elite that seem to focus a lot on themselves. And this is probably one of the failures of Ouattara's tenure as president is having failed to effectively reconcile the people of Côte d'Ivoire, but also even, you know, the political reconciliation at political level between himself and his former, I mean, not former, but his opposition, particularly those that were loyal to former president Laurent Gbagbo. So this is where we are today, I would say. What you've described in the first, you know, 20 minutes, 15 minutes of our conversation, you know, it just sounds like a, for lack of a better word, a total mess running up against an election where you have, as you described, different political actors in a highly polarized society fomenting angst and anger and questions about this upcoming election. And the last time there was in Côte d'Ivoire, a contested election, you know, 3,000 people were killed and the French military intervened. So, I mean, that is principally the reason why I wanted to talk to you today to get a sense of, you know, what can we expect in the weeks running up to the election and the weeks following the election? Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's not looking good, I would say. It's not looking good because Ouattara's candidacy is highly contested. As I also said, society is highly polarized. I'm speaking from Johannesburg, but I've also been to Côte d'Ivoire on several occasions over the years. And I've seen for myself that the society or the reconciliation process or idea did not really materialize. You know, for Ouattara, I mean, he has in his favor, a good economic record, right? Growth in Côte d'Ivoire since 2012, I mean, from 2012 to 2019, has been at around 8.5%. He has done, you know, some work on infrastructure development, on education, on health, etc. So Côte d'Ivoire, for many people, is a success story as far as economic prowess is concerned. But what is not spoken about is the fact that, you know, growth in Côte d'Ivoire does not necessarily materialize in the lives of the many people of the country. It's highly concentrated in the capital city, Abidjan. It serves a small minority of people. 
there are other issues and I'm getting to answering your question about what's coming next. The other thing is that since 2011, Côte d'Ivoire has embarked on a process of a security sector reform, which, you know, in my view, has not been finalized. There has been progress. But if you take the mutinies that we saw in 2017, it is an indication that there are even issues with the army in Côte d'Ivoire that still need to be modernized. So if you take this you know, picture that I've just painted and the fact that there is no consensus among the political class about the electoral process going forward, the constitutional court is contested, the electoral commission is contested, Ouattara's candidacy is contested, the conditions are just not ripe for a peaceful, transparent and accepted election at this point in time. So what we are likely to see, you know, is either as they have called for, the opposition has called for civil disobedience, we might see violence take place. We've already seen in August last month, 15 people died as a result of, you know, the protests that came against Ouattara's bid for a third term. So we are in a situation that is highly volatile. And I think whatever the opposition is going to push for might lead to violence and an election that may or may not take place. And if it does take place, that will be, I mean, whose result will be probably rejected. And this has implications for the legitimacy of if it's Watar who's reelected on his legitimacy and his government. and. Let me just finish by saying this. Why is this important? It's important because it's not just Côte d'Ivoire stability that is at stake. It is peace and stability in a region that is already facing peace and security challenges in the Sahel. And we've seen how the terrorist threat, you know, has spread from Sahel countries to, you know, countries of the West Coast of Africa, including Côte d'Ivoire itself, where there have been, you know, terrorist attacks in, I think, in 2016, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask, finally, what can the international community do to prevent sort of the worst case scenario from befalling Côte d'Ivoire right now and supporting the, the prospects, however remote it may seem at the moment, of a more peaceful and transparent election? Yes, I mean, there are a number of things that can be done. I don't know whether you include, I mean, when you say the international community, I don't know whether you include African regional yeah, bodies. Yeah, for sure. In that. Yeah, regional bodies, the UN, African Union, ECOWAS, you name it. Who has leverage right now to, to support? Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think that each of those different actors has a role to play. ECOWAS has been over the years quite strong in condemning, you know, what in the jargon on the continent is called unconstitutional changes of government, right? Third term, I think we call it. (laughs) Yes. There are a number of instruments that, you know, ECOWAS, the African Union have, you know, the ECOWAS, I mean, ECOWAS has a protocol on democracy and governance. The African Union has a similar framework whereby, you know, it is clearly stated that anything that goes against constitutional order, but although it's been mostly restricted to military intervention to remove an elected government, many are calling for constitutional amendments for presidents to run for a third term to be declared also unconstitutional changes of government or tampering or undermining the constitution, rather. So you might have seen that ECOWAS was involved in making sure that former president of the Gambia, Yaya Jame, relinquished power in 2017 when he was refusing to admit defeat. You've seen ECOWAS being equally active in the case of Mali. It's that same sort of quote-unquote activism that, you know, ECOWAS could have in order to not only make sure that governance challenges in the different countries are addressed. Issues such as national reconciliation, for instance, in Côte d'Ivoire, as I mentioned, security sector reform, you know, and all of the underlying issues that, you know, 
the different countries are facing can be looked at more clearly by those different regional bodies, including the African Union, as well as the United Nations. I mean, if I may sum it up, I think it really all comes down to having an open and honest conversation about, for me, the issues are governance issues, right? You've got to be able to address, properly address the issues with you know, the constitutional, the independence, for instance, of the constitutional court in Côte d'Ivoire, the independence of the electoral commission in Côte d'Ivoire, right? So making sure that the, what I would call the fundamentals of a constitutional democracy are there and are strong, but also creating, you know, an inclusive economic environment. It should not just be limited to growth in Côte d'Ivoire has been exceptionally high, but who is it benefiting? So there are a number of tools that ECOWAS, the African Union, as well as the UN can use in order to, I think, prevent more than anything, prevent things from situations from deteriorating. Going forward for this election, to be completely frank with you, there's very little that can be done without the goodwill of President Ouattara, because he said he's going to run, he's going ahead. And the opposition is also saying we are going to fight back. So you've got to find a way to bring them around the same table. I just don't see it happening until after the elections. Well, Mohammed, thank you so much for your time. I'll certainly be following the run-up to these elections with a high degree of trepidation. So, But thank you for explaining this all and for your analysis. This was very helpful. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you all for listening. Thank you to Mohammed. That was very helpful. You know, it's timely. The elections are coming at the end of October, uh, barring any potential delays, and the situation is very clearly fraught. So I was glad to... Be able to uh, shine a spotlight on it. Thank you so much to Mohamed Diata, and thank you again to the Carnegie Corporation for partnering with the podcast around this series. And as a disclosure, the opinions expressed in this conversation belong solely to those of us who expressed them. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Bye.